graduated with my Master's of Clinical Psychology in 1994, long time ago. And I actually had the best grades in my graduating class. I was right at the very tippy top. And I understood a lot. Part of the reason that I picked the particular program that I did is that this program, which was rare at the time, had a 450 hour practicum attached to it. Most of them didn't have that at that time. And I knew, intuitively and instinctively, I knew that I needed more than just understanding. And so in I go, I now have a whole bunch of knowledge and my practicum is about to begin. I am doing it at a cancer clinic under the direction of a psychologist, lovely man whose name was Scott Selleck. And this lovely man, knowing that this is my first ever experience into the counseling realm, gives me what he believes is going to be a relatively simple case. This is a young man, pretty much my age, who has lost his mother to cancer and he's grieving. So I go into these sessions, the first one or two sessions, I am offering my empathy, I'm offering my support, I'm kind of guiding this process. And then in the middle of my third session, he looks at me very intently and he says, you know, I'm hearing voices. You're hearing voices. So I take a very deep breath and I'm thinking, I just check it out. So what does that mean you're hearing voices, metaphorical voices? No, he's really hearing voices. He is hearing voices that nobody else is hearing. This is my inside face. <laughs> like that. And this was also at the beginning of my career, so that might have been my outside face a little bit too. <laughs> so I just pretty much BS'd my way through the rest of that hour. <laughs> Completely had no clue what to do with this poor young man who was obviously being really brave and asking for help and confessing what was legitimately going on for him. Later on, I'm in my, with my supervisor and I'm telling him what had happened here. And he had very much the same face. This kind of stillness comes over his face. And he says, well, what did you do? And I tell him what I did. I, my, my BS that I wandered with was, you know, this can be a part of a reaction to grief. <laughs> These things can all just be part of the same package. And I realized that in the middle of that session, it was kind of like I was dropped off in the middle of the wilderness. I had a map, but I didn't have a compass. I didn't really have a clue where I was supposed to go. And that's in that moment when my human instinct was to offer this young man some kind of explanation for what he was going through. What I did there is I offered him a kind of relief instead of actually providing therapy. And I think without understanding what it actually feels like to be able to sit in the anxiety of these kinds of moments, that's what our human instinct is. We offer relief instead of actual help, actual support, actual therapy. In order to be a competent counselor, you actually have to be familiar with the emotional terrain that you're leading your clients into. There is no way around it. I was led by my anxiety in that moment because I actually didn't know what it felt like to be in that territory, despite all of the three, two and a half, three or more years of learning that I had gone through myself. So my goal tonight for you and me is to kind of lean into the discomfort of that territory. Because that kind of discomfort, discomfort, the emotional stuff that we run into, our anxiety, is actually like a little signpost saying this way to evolution. This is the way we need to go. We need to go towards this feeling, not away from it. However, we're gonna start with having just a little fun. So, about three and a half years ago, I am approaching my 50th birthday. And Dwayne and I are facilitating this leadership workshop called The Root Awakening. 
And this is not part of the actual program, but all of a sudden a whole bunch of students in this program decide that they are gonna do a tandem sky jump, skydive jump, right? This is going to be their thing that they do because they just feel so alive as a result of what's happening in the workshop. They are all gonna go out and they are gonna do this skydive. Not part of the workshop. <laughs> not part of the workshop. So I'm listening to this and I'm a good supportive human and I'm going, oh yeah, you go, that's fabulous. I'm not the kind of person who would ever jump out of a plane. <laughs> no way. They then come back and they are alive and they are excited. They are full of everything that life has to offer. And I stopped and I said to myself, how come I'm not the kind of person who jumps out of a plane? <laughs> Why do I stop myself from even having that uncomfortable thought? <laughs> so before I could stop myself any further, I picked up my cell phone and I texted my daughter, because this is how you talk to a girl who is at that time 20, to, like this. And I say, how do you feel about jumping out of a plane with me for my 50th birthday? She responds instantly, OMG, I'm in. <laughs> because this is so unlike me. And then, because when you're about to do something freakishly terrifying, surely you ought to invite your friends to do it with you, right? <laughs> Logically, that's how it works. So then I invite my friends. My friends Steve and Maria also decide they're going to do this thing with me. How come it's not going? There we are, my daughter and me. There's a story to everything that occurred beyond, but right before this moment. <laughs> so, this skydive was booked for a particular day and a particular time. And I was getting myself ready for that moment. And the night before the skydive was booked, I barely slept. It, I, it is rolling around in my brain. I am thinking, why, why did I ever do this? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Because it's a step into the unknown. Because I am setting a course for my next however many years. This is symbolic of who I'm going to be over 50. <laughs> That's why I'm doing it. I wake up the next morning and the skydive has been postponed because there's cloud cover. We can't jump out of the plane. My anxiety continues to ratchet up higher and higher and higher because my plan now is not going to happen. I am not jumping out of the plane. And one of the things I very helpfully tell all my clients is we must learn to sit in our anxiety. We must learn to let ourselves be uncomfortable and not act so quickly to do something to fix it. By day two of cloud cover, I was saying to myself, I will never tell anybody to sit in their anxiety again for the rest of my life. This is horrible. Finally, the cloud cover lifts. We are now heading out to the field to do our tandem skydive. Now, because the thing has been backed up for days because of cloud cover, they are doing like conveyor belt tandem skydives. <laughs> it's going like the plane, the plane goes up, the people jump off, the people detach as soon as they've landed, they run, they collect the next load, up they go and down they go. So in this madness, they train you how you're gonna do the skydive. Here's the training they give you. Lay on this bench, on your stomach, Imagine that you are tipping out of the plane. You are going to look towards the horizon. Don't look down at the ground, look towards the horizon. <laughs> Cross your hands like so, and when you feel the tap in your shoulder, go like so. Now you are trained to jump out of a plane. <laughs> Do you feel prepared? I did not feel prepared. So, 
The other thing that happens is you sign this great long piece of paper and somewhere in this piece of paper it says if you go up in the air and you decide you don't want to jump, your person has permission to throw you out of the plane <laughs> because it's a little plane and you're going to block everybody from jumping. <laughs> so there we are, this moment. We're all lined up in this tiny little plane. That <laughs> smile is so not what I was actually feeling. <laughs> the thing is rattling like this because there's a big sort of garage door thing off to the side. I'm like, and then they open the door and there's one woman before me, there's me, and then there's my daughter. The woman before me freaks out. She freaks, she curls in a little ball. The guy goes, whoosh. <laughs> I am thinking to myself, my daughter is right behind me. I cannot be that woman, right? I cannot be the one like, like that. So here I am, tipping out of the plane. Looking at the horizon, not looking down. <laughs> Tipping out of the plane, probably the freakiest moment of my entire life right there. And then, free fall. <sighs> crazy. I have never felt anything that crazy in my whole life. Then the parachute hits and shh, silence. Just floating. And as I'm floating down, the guy that I'm attached to, whose job it is to keep me alive, <laughs> says, there's your daughter. Because she has now jumped out too. She's just over there floating. I can't speak at this point, so I go, woo, <laughs> in her direction. And now I'm the kind of person who jumps out of a plane. <laughs> We think about our identities as fixed somehow, but they're not, right? We think of ourselves as, I'm the kind of person who does this, I'm not the kind of person who does that. And we also operate by a certain set of fixed ex expectations about how life <coughs> is supposed to be. It's like we put up fences in the wilderness and we try to live within these apparently safe and defined boundaries. But these boundaries that we put up limit our personal evolution profoundly. And they also limit other people's as well. Evolution is always and forever. And you can't effectively help someone else evolve while you remain safe in your fixed identity, in your habitual and comfortable way of doing life, lacking the courage to move into that unknown territory yourself. Real contact accelerates personal evolution. The moment that I actually connected with those people who were so happy after their, their skydive, that's when I started asking myself, why not? Why not? Why am I not the kind of person who jumps out of a plane? In the counseling relationship, people assume that it's one person helping the other, that the relationship is one directional somehow, and it's actually both ways, because real connection is always both ways. You are always influencing each other. And connection isn't optional. We like to think of ourselves as individuals, little separate people who have the option to connect or not. But everything that we think, feel, say, or do has influence on others, and we are also always being influenced by others. We define ourselves and we experience ourselves through our relationships with other people. So we can distance in a relationship, we can unfriend somebody on Facebook, but that isn't actually disconnecting. What that, that is, is putting something into the relationship, right? When you unfriend someone, you are saying something to them. You are, doing, you are putting something into that relationship. And problems occur in those lines connecting us. That's where they live and get refueled through our actions and communication with each other. 
So from that perspective, every single connection that you have with another human being either reinforces the problem or helps the whole system, meaning all of these connected beings, evolve to a healthier state. There aren't actually any neutral moments. And this is how it works. When we have a moment and we have a conversation, there's two things happening. There's the content, which is what I'm saying to you with my words. And underlying that, there's a relationship message, which is all transmitted through body language, through tone of voice. And that relationship message is emotional. And it's far more powerful than the words that I'm saying. It always overrides the content. So the content's worth about 80%. The relationship, the underlying emotional message is worth about uh, content 20%. Relationship 80%. So how this specifically works neurologically is that we've got little things called mirror neurons in the front of our brain. And mirror neurons are the things that wire us to connect to other human beings. If I were to flash a picture on this screen so quick that you couldn't even register it consciously of somebody who is laughing or crying, your facial muscles would respond, even though you don't know that that's actually what you've seen. We're wired to pick up on each other's facial expressions in particular and body language and nuance like that. This is also why written communication like texts, emails, Facebook, posts are subject to so much crazy interpretation because when the emotional message isn't there, we fill in the blanks and interpret what's, what it is ourselves. So that's how things can go really, really crazy in the written word. All of us influence each other based on what we believe about ourselves, about others, and about life. And we do it emotionally. We're influenced by others based on what they believe about themselves, about other people, and about life. That might seem simple on the, on the surface, but it actually is not. <coughs> All of us are born with a past. The great debate in psychology when I was going through was whether nature, meaning your biology, or, or nurture, meaning your environment, was the thing that shaped your identity. What's the most powerful force, biology or an environment? We're now discovering that you can't actually separate those two. There's been a lot of beautiful studies in the field of epigenetics, <laughs> which is literally the study of how genes are impacted by the environment, that make it clear that they're actually the same force, nature and nurture. So for example, children and descendants of those who lived through the Holocaust never experienced the Holocaust themselves, but way back up there, either a parent or a grandparent did. These children show the same kind of traumatic wiring that you would expect of somebody who had experienced something like that. Mm -hmm. So they act kind of like they have post-traumatic stress disorder. They have the same kind of really finely tuned startle response. And this is actually kind of nature working for us rather, rather than against us. What's happening is nature says, you're, en you're obviously entering a hostile world. We better get you prepared. We better get you hypervigilant. We better get you ready. So whether you buy into that idea that the experiences of generations previous have shaped you on a biological level, it is really, really clear that our perceptions influ are highly, highly influenced by the experiences of those who have preceded us in our families. Rebecca Linder Hintz, who is the author of a book called Healing Your Family History, tells a brilliant story to illustrate this point. She's in her kitchen one day. She's preparing a ham. Her husband is watching her. She cuts off the ends of the ham. The husband says, how come you're cutting off the ends of the ham? She says, it tastes better that way. As she's hearing herself say this, she realizes there might be some illogic in this. <laughs> and so she picks up the phone, she calls her mother. She says, hey, 
how come we cut off the ends of the ham? And her mother says, oh, it tastes better that way. Now they're both kind of wondering, because they're both kind of hearing themselves say this. Eventually, they call grandma. <coughs> grandma answers the question, because that's how it fits into my pot. <laughs> So this is a, a kind of benign story about how that process works, right? The beliefs that we all hold at a core level and kind of inadvertently transmit in our relationships are not so benign. We all have fears about being not good enough, flawed, unlovable, in what we metaphorically call the basement of our psyches. And we call it the basement because literally we all try to lock that sucker up and throw away the key. We don't want anyone going near that thing. And these come from moments of disconnection that we experienced early in life. As human beings, the very first part of us to get wired up is the part of us that, that is emotional. And that's because it facilitates bonding with our caregivers. How many parents do we have in the room? So you know that feeling, that crazy feeling that happens when this new being enters the world and all of a sudden you had no idea you could love something that much. The child is experiencing that too. Our emotional self is getting all wired up and this bond is being created. <coughs> and that bond's purpose for being is survival, right? It, young infants, human infants are vulnerable. They need to have that bond in order to survive. My personal view on it is also that it's kind of spiritual. I think it's not an accident that we're wired for love and connection before we're wired as, for anything else as human beings. However, our thinking brain, our ability, I'm pointing here because it's in our frontal lobes, <laughs> Our ability to sort through facts and understand what's happening, that's, that doesn't kick in until later. It just kind of begins at around the age of five or seven. The first time you have a memory that's like a little story you tell yourself, this happened, this happened, this happened, that's when that's just beginning. And it doesn't fully kick in until early adulthood. So when things happen, sometimes traumatic things, like when a child is abused in some way, Sometimes more subtle things, as when some part of you isn't seen or heard or validated, when things happen that feel like we, it results in disconnection, that bond is not there, it is terrifying for a little kid. They don't have the ability to understand. So we're flooded with fear, and because we can't actually sort out what it means, we make it mean something horrible about ourselves. This is happening because I'm bad. This is happening because I'm unlovable somehow. And I'm talking about it like it's a thought, but it's not, it's a feeling. This is me. <laughs> At about the age of seven or eight. At about this age, I, uh, I was one of those kids who was constantly struggling with feeling accepted in my peer group. I could never quite work my way in. And when I did, something would happen and I'd be on the outside again. And during this time period, when I was really wrestling with just figuring out how to have a friend, I did have one friend that I would call my best friend. One night, I was at my best friend's house for a sleepover. And her older sister, who she normally would have shared the bedroom with, was off on a sleepover herself. So my friend was on the bottom bunk, I was on the top bunk. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and one of her two older brothers was standing over the bed. I woke up, I see this shadow, I hear this breathing, and I'm scared. Our instinctive response when we're frightened as humans is fight, flee, or freeze. Children most often freeze, and that's what I did. I just went, closed my eyes again, pretended I was asleep, and just lay really still. He then proceeded to sexually molest me, and the whole time I just pretended that I was asleep. He then left the room, and for a very brief moment, I kind of got a glimpse of him from the, the hallway as the light was shining, and 
And I don't remember what happened after that. The next thing I actually remember is walking home with my friend the next day and I told her what had happened. And she said, don't tell your parents. Whatever you do, do not tell your parents. My brother is gonna get into so much trouble. So I didn't. And in retrospect, I think I didn't, mostly because I didn't wanna lose my only friend. I then learned that she has gone home she has told her parents what happened. There's a huge blow up in the family and the oldest brother is kicked out of the home, gone. The next time I was over at her house, the younger brother walked in the room and he was wearing the same shirt that I had very briefly glimpsed as he was leaving the room. So I identified the wrong brother. My friend had asked me, was this guy big or little? And I said he was big. I remember even now this horrible feeling when I knew that I had identified the wrong guy. It was very powerful and for many, many years overrode the actual experience of being sexually molested for me. So that is a powerful little thing that got shut down in my basement. From those moments, a lot happens really quickly. We take on these fears about ourselves, these suspicions about ourselves, and we say to ourselves, okay, who I am essentially is not good enough. What do I have to be to get the love back? Who do I have to become to be okay? Who do I have to be to get friends and to get approval? And we try behavior A doesn't work, behavior B doesn't work, behavior C, bingo, it works. So who I am in my basement is not good enough. I'm going to become behavior C. My behavior C was, I just am not going to make mistakes. I will become perfect. And my behavior C, this, this event that happened with my friend's brother happened outside of my family environment. But how I chose to handle it, this idea that I'm just going to become as perfectly as humanly possible, was influenced by what was happening inside my family environment. My dad was a perfectionist. My dad grew up as a middle son with an older brother who was perfect at everything. And my dad really, really was trying to live up to that constantly. And so in the home environment, that was very much a part of how my family navigated and my dad's way of being. So for all of us, we have all of these strategies that kind of emerge out of trying to deal with alone, trying to deal alone with what's happening in the basement. I really want to emphasize alone because human beings actually have the ability to survive some horrific things if we can stay in connection. It actually isn't the severity of the trauma that determines what we end up wrestling with as much as it is that we don't feel like somebody is there with us. It is the disconnection that really causes the pain and the damage. So we evolve all of these strategies that come out of our basement, out of the fear, trying to hide, pretend, defend what's happening down there. And sometimes, we start living in that strategic personality so much that we don't even think we got a basement. We're not even aware of it anymore. We're just aware that we don't feel good. And the irony is those strategies only end up reinforcing the basement. So for my strategy of being a perfectionist, over time and over my lifetime, it has been my experience that what seemed to me to be little mistakes end up having huge consequences, big, huge consequences, puzzling for me. Until I realized that when you're a perfectionist, you set the whole world up to expect you to be impeccable. <laughs> right? You transmit that. Yes, I am perfect. Yes, you can expect me to do it perfectly. I will be perfect for you. When you disappoint them, the, the disappointment can be disproportionate because you have set everybody up to expect this. <clears throat> All of us 
we have these strategies that evolve out of personal experience, and we also have strategies that are taught to us based on family losses that occurred way back when. We have strategies and defenses that our family also tell us out of very good intention that are meant to help you never experience the bad thing that whoever experienced it back there did. We're taught these strategies and defenses, and they also end up kind of returning us to the same kind of situations we're trying to get away from. And this is how patterns can also get repeated from one generation to the next. The choice to protect your basement by hiding, pretending, and defending isn't neutral. What you don't work out yourself will impact others. It will. It took me until I was in my 40s to realize that what happened with my friend's brother actually had an impact on me. I'm a practicing therapist. Shockingly, my daughter Erin is a perfectionist. The perfectionist credo that I lived by is perfection equals safety. If you are perfect, you can avoid shame and disaster. I tried to figure, I asked my daughter not so long ago, so how, how did you become a perfectionist? I did my very best to make sure that you just were always and loved and supported and never felt criticized. How did this happen? Here's what my daughter said to me. The ways that I felt most supported by you were often one tiny step away from pressure. Here is a typical thing that would happen in her childhood. I would be helping her get ready for a music festival. She was a great little singer. I would be helping her prepare. She would be getting ready to do this thing. Then she would go on stage and she would be singing and I would be filled with anxiety. And I would be mouthing the words to her song as she was singing it on the stage. I could not stop myself. <laughs> She'd be singing and I'd be like, mouthing the words along with her. The relationship message in that is this is really important. You are one step away from shame and disaster. <laughs> that's how we do it. Wasn't my intention, but that's how we do it. Interesting little side note, my daughter later in life, not as a teenager, but later in life fell in love with Harry Styles. Do you know who Harry Styles is? Sort of a teen singer guy. And he went out on so, a solo thing not long ago. And she was, she loves Harry Styles. She loves him. He was performing on Saturday Night Live. She had his album. This was a big deal that he was gonna perform solo on Saturday Night Live. <clears throat> we are all sitting watching Harry Styles perform and she is mouthing the words. <laughs> like she can transmit to Harry through the television screen what, his, what he needs to say. <laughs> so we all have to address what's happening in our basements or to even become aware that we've got one in the first place so that we aren't unconsciously acting it out on, in some way and impacting others. And this is why we have to be in a constant state of, of evolution as counselors and as humans. <laughs> Both. We literally stop the process of evolution the minute that we revert to strategy and defense. We keep ourselves and the whole system stuck because what we're putting into it isn't real. Not too long ago, Duane and I went and attended this panel discussion called Confronting the Disinformation Age. It was uh, downtown at Queen Elizabeth the Theater, and David Frum, Sue Gardner, and Christopher Wiley were all talking about how come people are running with things that aren't true in such crazy ways. What the heck is happening in our society? <clears throat> they didn't invite me up on the panel. I really wanted to go up in the panel. <laughs> and share my thoughts about why this is happening. So now you all get to be my audience to share my thoughts about what is happening. The relationship message always overrides the content. It's more powerful. Even as adults, we're more influenced by feeling than fact. 
And in particular, we want to feel comfortable and safe, and we don't want to feel uncomfortable. <clears throat> when we feel understood, it feels good. This is our little mirror neurons in action. So even if what we're feeling hurts, when we feel understood, it feels good. And so we gravitate quickly to the solution that's offered, regardless of whether it actually conforms to the facts. If something that's presented that makes us feel uncomfortable, we won't necessarily stay in that discomfort long enough to examine it. We're just gonna navigate our way quickly back to comfort. Right? I'm not the kind of person who jumps out of a plane. That thing that happened to me when I was eight didn't really affect me. We'll also give credibility to things that don't have a basis in fact if the relationship message is comforting in some form or fashion. So based on all of that, life organizes itself around what we put into it. The state of the world is a result of what we're each putting into it. When you understand this relationship web that we all live in, which to me, like this is a picture of humanity's brain. When you understand that, you've tapped into your true power as an agent of change, whether that be for yourself, for your family, or professionally in the service of other people. You have a powerful, powerful influence. You are not at the mercy of outside forces. You actually are a force yourself. Every single moment counts, every interaction. What we each put into those lines creates the world that we have, period. Your unloving and defended actions might not be as dramatic or brutal as a terrorist's, but every unloving action put into that collective system influences the whole thing. And living on that evolutionary edge is the goal. We have a responsibility to be the very best self we're capable of being. And in so doing, we have the power to bring that best self out in other people as well. And here is just a little glimpse into how life is organizing itself around what we're put into it right now. The UN says we have 12 years to turn the planet back from global warming. 12 years. People are leaving their homes in a desperate search for safety. In many places of the, in the world, women are still not considered to be persons with rights. They're property. Dwayne and I have had all kinds of conversations over the dinner table about what is happening, what is going on. And my take on it is that to a certain extent, we've been living in a nice little first world bubble, and perhaps in Dwayne and my case, a little white first world bubble in particular. And we're imagining that the connection that we have with other people that we share this earth with is somehow optional in one way, that the influence is from us to them. And that isn't how it works. Connection isn't an option, and it's not one way. We're constantly influencing and being influenced. These kind of pictures are just a tiny little glimpse into the painful reality of where the human race is struggling. And we could keep going all night and probably all week and probably all year with these kind of pictures, right? Life is organizing itself around what we're putting into it. We're being shown who we are as a whole human species. The level of consciousness that we're actually operating from collectively as one human race. No one is immune. No one is significantly more evolved. We're all part of this. That is a shocking and uncomfortable thought. And we shouldn't turn away from it. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. Every now and then, I hear a variation of this from somebody. I don't watch the news. It's bad for my mental health. Or even more higher up, I live on a much higher plane of consciousness. I only want to live in love. 
Our unwillingness to face uncomfortable truths hurts us. It hurts us personally. It hurts us collectively. Pain is cascading through this relationship web that we're all a part of. And when we're emotionally irresponsible, which means when we're unwilling to face that which makes us uncomfortable, we contribute to that pain. We feel uncomfortable. We try to alleviate this discomfort through taking either irresponsible action or non-action. <coughs> the ways in which we avoid pain is how the problems and dilemmas get amplified and grow into such huge, critical, and polarizing situations. Evolution isn't comfortable ever. Heading into the wilderness, into the unknown territory, is always scary. If you need to protect yourself from discomfort, you will deny truth when it is uncomfortable. The more you deny it, the more it gets in your face. You can change what you do acknowledge. Face it, feel it, then fix it. Take responsible action based on fully appreciating the landscape of what's in front of you. I'm sure some of you who are sitting here listening to me now who have heard me before are going, what about the friendly universe, Catherine? <laughs> For those of you who haven't been here, we often use this quote from Einstein, which is a reporter once asked Einstein, what is the most important question facing humanity today? And his response was, is the universe a friendly place or not? The friendly universe, people, might very well be saying, you know, the human experiment is not going so well. How about we give the planet to the ants? They're hardy little suckers. They cooperate. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> the friendly universe isn't a happy bubble. The friendly universe is all about seeing something more than just crap in the middle of a difficult situation. The friendly universe is about hope. The friendly universe inspires us to become actively part of that friendliness. There's a fine line between denial and hope. Protecting yourself, consciously or unconsciously, is going to result in someone somewhere being impacted. It took me until my 40s to realize the thing that had happened to me at the age of eight was a thing. And as I said, I'm a therapist. I totally knew it happened. I wasn't amnesic or anything. It's just that I would think about it, and that the minute I would think about it, my mind just kind of slipped away went another direction. And I continued to live as a perfectionist by the credo that it's not OK to make a mistake. My daughter is a perfectionist. My friendly universe is based on a firm belief that love can heal any mess that we bring to it. Love is bigger than any mess that humans can make if we bring the mess fully, which requires acknowledging it, looking at it, and ultimately doing something about it. The evolutionary process is always an ongoing, and if you don't continue to explore the edges of your wilderness, facing your own personal uncomfortable zones, you can't responsibly help another person face their pain either. It takes tremendous courage to let yourself be uncomfortable with someone in pain. It's hard to do. Our instinctive offering is relief instead of help. I remember um, probably around the time that my daughter was four or five, I worked with a woman who accidentally killed her two-year-old child. Horrible. My daughter was in that same age range at the time. What happened is she had dropped her kids off at the babysitter's house. They all ran up to the step. She went to turn around. She's backing up the driveway. She runs over something. Her little tiny two-year-old had run back to the car to grab his pack sack that he forgot. Being with someone in pain like that is at the core of therapy. I can feel it even now, like I can feel it now with her, even though that was a long time ago that I worked with her. 
Healing comes from being able to carefully and tenderly explore that territory, really completely, legitimately revealing the way through, not from trying to provide relief from that kind of discomfort. When we feel seen and understood, it feels good, even in the middle of intense pain. Those of you who have experienced that know what I'm talking about. It's kind of weird. Here you are feeling all this pain, but somebody gets you, and that feels good. That feeling of connection literally pulls us out of the basement and back into life again. People need to feel you with them. They need to feel seen and understood. This is what allows all of us to kind of push towards the edges of that wilderness, sometimes really gradually and carefully, depending on what they're facing. And therapy is kind of this ongoing, complicated dance of real connection. Offering honest empathy and understanding, helping someone open to their vulnerability, deepening that connection, activating the correction, often over and over and over again as you kind of push further and further into the edges of that wilderness. And in order to be a competent counselor, you have to be familiar with that terrain. You have to know what it feels like to be in the wilderness yourself. Not just understand the territory intellectually. Over the many years of evolution of our PRAC program, I've noticed that there's two general types of people who come into it. The people who want to be counselors, who often have no idea that they have a basement, <laughs> or they think they've healed it. And the people doing it for personal growth who are hyper aware that they have a basement because they've been dragging that sucker along with them for their whole lives. They know it's there. I know this because Dwayne and I sit in the, in the back as our assistants, who are our council training people, are introducing themselves at the Awakening Workshop, which is kind of our prerequisite workshop. They're, and the, the counselor training one, people often say this. They're supposed to, when they introduce themselves, let you know what they learned about the Awakening for themselves. They will often say, I learned that I had a basement. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. And conversely, our personal growth students, who are not necessarily in it for counselor training, often reconsider when they realize that they can turn that pain into purpose, that it has meaning and can be intensely helpful for other people. But if you're operating only from the level of understanding, if you're disconnected from your own basement and think you don't have one or think you've healed it, you're much more likely to offer relief to your clients instead of therapy. And that's not out of bad intention, right? We don't know what we don't know. I believe absolutely down to the ground that our graduates come out knowing how to navigate that wilderness. Not at a level of mastery by any means, right? But the territory itself is not foreign. And I will add as well that the graduates who come out with the most confidence are also the ones who have completely thrown themselves in to the program. Back to our mirror neurons for a moment. If a person doesn't feel seen and understood by you, doesn't feel cared about by you, they have no reason to listen to anything you have to say, period. Courageous conversations, the kind that take place both inside and outside of therapy, have to start with some kind of positive relationship message. Like, I love you, you're important to me, I really want to work this out. This is true in your intimate relationships, and it's equally true with somebody you don't know. I've watched tons of commentators on television talking about how a feeling of disenfranchisement is contributing to the polarized and entrenched arguments that are erupting in people's homes and on the news and on social media. Few people are discussing how to bridge that gap. How do you extend empathy and understanding to another human being even when they might be advocating for or actually doing something <coughs> you passionately disagree with? This is what you must learn to do as a therapist because believe me, you don't just get people as clients that you relate to. <laughs> this is what you learn how to do in our program. 
And at the end of the day, you can only change what you're responsible for. What you don't take responsibility for will impact others. The task is to take full responsibility for that which is under your control and in your territory and let go of that which is not. Another way of explaining this, the, the metaphor that we often use, is that it's your job to do 100% of your 50% of every relationship that you are in. So if the relationship is 100%, your job is to do 50%. If you are over here at 90, you are over-functioning. And I know my people are in this room right now. <laughs> I am one of you. If you are doing 40 or 30, you are under-functioning. Over-functioners in particular misinterpret what it means to do your 50% because when you're an over-functioner, you are doing something that someone else could or should be doing for, for, yourself, for themselves and you imagine that you are doing their share plus your own. But really, you are only messing about in their business <laughs> and trying to control their process. This is how come when overfunctioners try to back up to that 50% line, it's so confusing and they often go the whole way and don't do diddly squat. <laughs> they go way back. I'm just not overfunctioning. So you can only change what you're responsible for. You cannot change what someone else is responsible. And doing 100% of your 50% isn't about ticking a bunch of tasks off your list and determining, now I've done my part, the rest is up to you. That is not how it works. <laughs> doing 100% of your 50% means you are functioning at capacity. Being the best self that you are capable of being and bringing that self to the world. What that looks like isn't measurable except in relation to you. I had, after I was talking about overfunctioning, I had a woman come up to me and say, I get it, I'm an overfunctioner, but my child is disabled. I can't not overfunction. That's not overfunctioning. That child is acting at capacity. You meeting them is not overfunctioning. That is not overfunctioning. For someone who's clinically depressed, I might say, don't watch the news. That might be beyond that person's immediate capacity. But if you're choosing not to watch the news just because it's going to burst your happy bubble, that's another thing entirely. You're protecting yourself at someone else's expense. So functioning at capacity isn't a steady state. It's not measurable in that way because we're always and forever evolving. It essentially means that you are setting up camp at the edge of the wilderness and constantly pushing into that unknown territory, constantly willing to explore. That might not be comfortable, but it is alive. For all of these reasons, our PRAC program is built around the idea that your life is the curriculum. Every bit of what you learn is first applied to yourself, because as we've seen who you are in all your relationships, including with potential clients, is the key to systemic evolutionary change. What you put into your relationship web ripples out to the whole world. So no matter what your reason for coming tonight, whether that is that you're considering this program for personal or professional development, addressing your own curriculum is vital. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I hope this evening has been a little fun and a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Thanks for your time and attention. Can I just check in with the audience? Who um, right now in this moment is feeling either inspiration, hope, or insight? Can you raise your hands? Yeah! Woo! <laughs> Let's give it another great applause to Captain Thank you. Awesome.